it's showtime this morning. Depending on where you are, good morning, good evening, good late, late night. And thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be talking about our secret sauce. And we'll tell you what that means in just a minute. But first, uh, why don't we introduce ourselves? Heather and Daniel. Heather, why don't you go first? I'm Heather Darwin. I'm one of the nurse practitioners that works for PrevMed Health Dr. Brewer. And nice to be here today and uh, talk about the topics we're going to talk about. Thank you. And Daniel? I'm Daniel Trevor. And um, I discovered Dr. Ford a few years ago and became a follower right after I had had a heart attack and which led to me taking a deep dive into the science to find out how this could happen to what I thought was Mr. Healthy, a symptom-free, lean person. Uh, and then I wound up writing this book um, called Unholy Trinity. And, um, and I asked Dr. Ford if he would write chapter 22, which is like he's talking about, and he calls it the secret sauce. Uh, and what are the most important blood labs and scans that anyone can buy online without needing a doctor's prescription? That way they can find out themselves if they've got something lurking, ready to pounce, or they're fine, or somewhere in between that needs attention. And uh, these are tests that most doctors either don't know about or don't order or maybe there's some complication with insurance, that kind of thing. But it's just simple things that <laughs> anyway, so that's who I am. And I, I fully recovered and uh, with the help of Dr. Ford's secret sauce. <laughs> so speaking of secret sauce, you know, people... Uh, Michelle and, and Janice, when they were involved, used to constantly say, oh, don't give out your lab recs. Don't give out your lab rec, requ rec meaning lab requisition. And um, I think it, somebody did a fact check for me the other day, and I think they said it was Vince Lombardi that said, you know what, we'll give other people our, our um, playbook and we'll still beat them. And it's his point was there's a lot of discipline. There's a lot of know-how that that's involved. Um, so we'll talk about that uh, today and we'll go over a lot of the specific labs that we use in terms of evaluating your, our metabolism, our patient's metabolism uh, for the most common and most vicious causes of death and disability. Uh, Dan, Daniel, you mentioned this book. Well, to me, this book is a lot more than this book. As you and I discussed, I got this call one day from a fellow. It turned out to be you. And he said, you know, I had a heart attack. I was in the hospital. I started looking around to see why I had it. I discovered your channel and I started just uh, learning a lot. And I started putting it down uh putting it down in writing so people could actually access it in a more organized fashion and you didn't say this part but i knew it was there then all of your scattered stuff everywhere on youtube so i appreciated you organizing that um i went ahead and contributed that that chapter on testing and um you went on to, once you got started enrolling, you went on to add a lot more. Uh, you added seed oils. You added a lot of information that uh, people can use to protect their health. And what's your big news? Well, the, and also just to comment on that before the news is that, um, well, it did launch yesterday. That's the news. And I'll give you some information on that. But the, um, I wanted to give the whole history and background how we've been misled for decades by some of the most flagrant scientific frauds uh, that have been perpetrated on the populations and still believed by many to this day, including our doctors. They've been fooled, too. And when I say fooled, I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, Mark Twain's famous quote. He said, um, uh, what was it? <laughs> it's easier to fool people than to convince them they have been fooled. Because once you that fool somebody, is very interesting. They, He's a smart. He was a smart guy. He, he. I'm sure he's still with us somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's easier to fool people than it is to convince them they have been fooled. Because once they lock in on something, 
you know, and they think it that, that they heard them. it from some some from some authority or some person who presumably knows better or more than them, or they have an Ivy League degree or something like that, and they think, oh, well, that must be it. And no, it doesn't matter the degrees. Anybody can get a degree. Uh, well, maybe not anybody, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and so too many people have been fooled and I want to go through the whole history of how all that happened and the research and so forth so that they understand and they get pissed off as I was <laughs> when I discovered all this, I went, wow, I've got it all wrong. I've got it all wrong. Don't tell me about these heart healthy whole grains, <laughs> especially the way they're made these days. It's not like the whole grains of yesteryear, many yesteryears or hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, so <clears throat> here's a stat that blew me away. I think it's like 1.4 million books a year are published on Amazon. It's like, what? Wow. And I got on my calculator and that's like 30,000 a week. Yeah. Right. Just to put things into perspective and me and my publishing team, we decided that, you know, you on Amazon, you want to ch uh, choose three cat. You get three chat categories to choose and then certain keywords, seven keywords. So the categories uh, that were chosen were heart disease, diabetes and low carb diets. So it debuted. The good news is at number one in heart disease, number one in uh, diabetes and number one in low carb diet. So, yay! Wow. Here we go. Let's, let's have a toast. Here's I'm toasting my morning, my one coffee that I have in the morning. That's amazing. Well, there you go. So that, Congratulations. Now, how long that stays there is another story because it can fluctuate daily, right. uh, that kind of thing. But as long as people can, and this is what I'm requesting, is that if there's some word of mouth can go, if you enjoy the book. And you find a few things in there that you think a loved one or a friend could benefit from, um, especially if they're 30 or older uh, or 40, because uh, that's when people start start to slow down. They start to get some symptoms, this and that, uh, because, you know, when you're in your 20s, I mean, I remember I, I was invincible. There's nobody. I mean, I wasn't even 40 years old was never going to happen. Right. Let alone 50, 60 and these diseases that people you hear about old people getting diseases. What's that about? You know, that's just never going to happen. So I don't even bother targeting that audience, even though it is for them. They're just not interested. So but anyway, so, um, Daniel, let me interrupt and yeah. um, ask you, have you can you read a few of the um, the plugs that you you've gotten? Nina oh Tykeholtz, some of the other folks. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you're talking about some of the, uh, yeah, let me get that in front of me here. Uh, While you do, I'm going to show the most important one. <laughs> Guess who that is? Love it. That's my mom. So here's the backstory on that. So, you know, I wrote a book in this space, <laughs> and I'll acknowledge it's kind of boring. And I've acknowledged to mom that it's kind of boring. So uh, a couple of months ago, Daniel sent me a complimentary copy of this. He waited till I'd already bought one before he sent it, but he did. Oh, my God. Don't <laughs> tell me that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You did. Uh, and so mom finds it. <clears throat> she picks it up. She starts reading it. And I say, OK, well, that's good. And then she keeps reading it. And she keeps reading. And I said, well, you're done with it? No, 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 no. She's been reading that for about over a month now. <laughs> and just a couple of days ago, she, she talked to my sister and she said, would you please order me some magnesium? And then she starts going through asking me a bunch of questions about magnesium. I go over to the counter to uh, see what kind of magnesium she said she had already purchased. It was some magnesium I bought for her a year ago. So bottom line is she's listening to you, Daniel. She won't listen to her son. <laughs> I know when you told me your mom's reading my book, but she's not reading yours. What's that about? <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. So that's a picture of her that you took reading my book. Yes, exactly. 
you, I can't. Um, I didn't get a good shot of the cover. You know, that's the cover. That's your book right there. Right. And I can't get her to put it. I can't get her to give it back to me. So I've got my copy that I bought, and she's got your courtesy copy. Wow, that's amazing. That's I'm just I'm I'm flattered. I mean, you know, I mean, the whole thing was. I, when I started chronicling all my experiences and everything that I was learning, I had learned years ago, especially I've done so much sales and marketing over the years that you have to couch communications in such a way that it's really going to be received by the viewer or the listener or the, the audience, you know, who's your audience. You got to put it at a level where, you know, so I've always been pretty good at that. And so I wrote it with that in mind. Uh, in so far as my audience. So I didn't want to overcomplicate things because, you know, there's many books that people will use these words that are just nobody knows the meaning of. And you got to really have uh, several yeah. dictionaries by your side or have to stop. And, and that is key, though. That is good that they do that. It is. I have to look up words because um, that's the biggest killer of study. When you go yeah. by too many words that you don't understand, by the time your eyes get to the bottom of the page, you're you don't know what you just read. You're blank. And so you have to go back and find out, okay, so where was I doing well and then move forward from there. But that's anyway, what, yeah, I've got that's what engaged me. That's what won me over that first time you sent me the manuscript. I was a little bit irritated because I said, you know what, all this stuff is coming off my my channel. That was early on. But the point that hit me was yours was so much more readable and that just won me over. And I said, you know what, this is, uh, this is about getting that message out. And it's about getting that message out to people that don't have all of that vocabulary and don't want to take the time to learn it. And who, who would blame them? Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Listen, I had to, this was not written for doctors because they led me astray. <laughs> I mean, and doctors aren't going to be listening anyway. They're too yeah, busy. Exactly. Exactly. So, Who's this so take, a few, always... take a couple of minutes and just read some of those, um, some of those plugs for you on the background oh my or God. on the back let's cover of the book. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, well, I have Dr. Mark Hyman, who is a you ever 15 heard of him? time, uh, 15 time New York times bestselling author, 15, not one or two, but 15. Yeah. And he's head of functional medicine at Cleveland Clinic, which is ranked number one globally for cardiovascular care. And he wrote, unlike other books on heart disease, diabetes, and what foods make us fat, sick, and addicted, Unholy Trinity is written from the unique perspective of one of the millions of victims of pervasive and deadly lies. Daniel Trevor pulls no punches and reveals the truth. All science-backed. Trevor gives you the basics of what to do and what to avoid to live a long and healthy life. Get this book, exclamation point. I love that you added that there too. And then I have uh, Dr. Lou Ignaro. He is the winner of the Nobel Prize in Medicine for discovering nitric oxide, which as you know, is so important for the arteries and the vascular system. And he's also the author of Dr. No, the discovery that led to a Nobel Prize and Viagra. I mean, his discovery was why, what led to this thing called Viagra. But anyway, he wrote, <clears throat> Unholy Trinity is about preventing major disease before it's too late. Daniel Trevor had a heart attack, then undertook an incredible amount of scientific research to reveal what we all need to do to stay out of the hospital. Trevor skillfully translates science for the average reader and his unique sense of humor makes this an exciting and enjoyable read. I'm glad he was getting some of my jokes, you know? <laughs> especially after I go through this whole, he loved this one that I have. Um, so I was debunking the whole cholesterol thing, you know, and, um, Annals talking about how low cholesterol can lead to all these diseases. And, and I have all the studies and everything right there. And the people who live the longest, have high cholesterol and people who have low cholesterol die much earlier. And I, I, after listing out all of these things, I, I wrote something like, okay, forget the heart healthy egg whites and bring us the cowboy steak and egg special, please. And he yeah. thought that was just, <laughs> he says, yes, that's great. You know, so I'm, I'm joking throughout the book. I try to keep it light cause that's the way I am. I'm, you know, and the jokes don't have to be good. Most of them aren't. 
<laughs> oh, come on. Give me a break there. Some of them. Go, well, they're go better, my, better than my jokes. I'll, I'll admit that <laughs> freely. And then, you know, it, it, still, it still gives you, it, you know, it lightens it up. My, my book is a tome kind of thing. It's, it's heavy. I get a lot of good comments about it, but I would, I like your writing style. Well, you know, you got to be who you are and I'm just a silly person anyway. And I just tried to be childlike instead of childish, but, uh, you know, cause I got to basically be who I am. I know some people may not like my style cause I'm a little rough around the edges, but Hey, I'm just a lower class street kid from Philly who learned early on how to study well and, you know, that kind of thing. And that's who I am. And I'm not, you know, I don't want to, I never want to put on airs that I'm anything above that and so on. But your friend, Dr. Philip Ovedia, cardiac surgeon, performed over 3,000 heart surgeries, best selling author, and host of the popular podcast, Stay Off My Operating Table. He also called his book that. And he wrote, um, and again, he's a cardiac surgeon. Unholy Trinity is a comprehensive yet digestible summary of the root cause of heart disease from the perspective of one of the millions of people affected by this epidemic. Daniel Trevor gives actionable recommendations that can help anyone looking to prevent or manage this leading cause of death worldwide. I recommend this book to anyone who does not want to see me or one of my colleagues standing over them in a hospital bed, read this book. So anyway, those are just a few of, I have some other glowing ones too, but you know, you get the idea. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, no, you mentioned, yeah. you mentioned this, uh, uh, cholesterol myth, the cholesterol redirection, the focus on cholesterol. Let's miss, uh, probably misdirected. We're going to uh, cover a little bit more of that in our short content. We have a, another, yet another study huge study looking at a lot of folks and making the point yet again that metabolic disease, meaning prediabetes, diabetes, is far more important than LDL. And here we have a comment from a viewer, JMK, uh, comments a lot. I think Mark Twain should have talked to most cardiologists and lipidologists. <laughs> yes. And I'm yes. going to share this. Uh, I'm a big Peter Atia fan. I get a lot of crossover between my channel and Peter's channel. When he has Schneiderman or mostly Schneiderman because Schneiderman's the one that keeps talking about ApoB. Uh, when he has those guys on, sometimes it's day spring. Um, I get call after call after call or email. Well, Doc, did you see this? Uh, and I've had, and I get people, patients uh, calling and making a request. Can I take a PCSK9? And it's interesting, I, um, I got Peter's book, I read it, uh, did a full download on it the past few weeks, and we're thinking about just doing a deeper dive into this ApoB thing. If you look at, I went deeper into Schneiderman's article, for example, and it's all about ApoB. And it's very, very interesting. When you read the article, one of the article the articles that Peter depends on, he said in this book, look, I, I'm not a lipidologist. I'm not a cardiovascular guy, not an epidemiologist. I just depend on these lipidologists. And he named them, uh, Dayspring, Snyderman. And I can't remember the third one. And he said, I just depend on what they're saying. And, and so when you go back and you read the articles, the um, Mende pardon the technical term, Mendelian randomization articles that Dayspring mentions a lot and that uh, Schneiderman mentions. And you read Schneiderman's article on ApoB, the Mendelian randomization trial is just full of internal inconsistencies. It's clearly not something that I would want to base the, uh, the health of a generation on. And that's exactly what we've done. Um, <clears throat> When you look at the at Schneiderman's article on ApoB, he's saying at the end of the day, he's not saying ApoB is more important than anything else other than LDL. So at the end of the day, again, I get call after call, um, email after email. Hey, Doc, please focus on ApoB. We cover ApoB. You know, uh, 
if if you will, in just a second, when I get through the, with this rant, uh, Heather, if you'll talk just a little bit about what we do with APOB. Or wait, I tell you what, why don't we hold it until we, I think we'll cover that in the lab section mm -hmm. uh, a little bit later. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's uh, APOB is nothing but uh, LDL in lipidologist clothing. <laughs> Yeah, and those lipidologists you mentioned are brilliant men too. Oh, they but, are. Uh, but you but know, you it's, have a to remember. it's a matter of relative importances. It's like there's it something that's this important and there's something that's this important. So which one do you want to focus on? If this can influence a realm of uh, effects and this one, not so much or a smaller, or it leads over to this one. I mean, this is the one you want to go after. And that is, insulin resistance because that's where the inflammation starts right no no question uh if, if i think we've all heard the term majoring on the minors and it's <laughs> just what you said the lipid the lipidologists are very smart people i'm a major fan of uh day spring oh, yeah. uh, we'll cover we'll cover some stuff that i learned from him today from him and peter on, on their talk about hdl and triglycerides but at the end of the day a lipidologist is someone who's taken many extra years to learn cholesterol and lipids. That's right. Under the assumption that they are the major driver. And um, I, I think that's, you know, it's, as you mentioned, it's, it's not that uh, the cholesterol doesn't matter. Right. It's that it matters less. I mean, you, you, all you have to do is look at, again, pardon another technical term, uh, homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. These are people uh, that are born with two, um, what some people would call mutations, two genetic variations, one from mom, one from dad, which totally mess up the way they uh, metabolize their cholesterol. And they end up with LDL cholesterol, not total cholesterol, but LDL cholesterol 350 and higher. Those people do have problems early on, quick, as in teenagers, 20-year-olds uh, having heart attacks. So LDL does matter. But when you look at the world's population, not just the U.S. population, India, Brazil, uh, just the rest of the world, uh, Hispanics, um, it's metabolic disease. And exactly. we'll get... We'll cover that again a little bit later, but thank just you. One for last, yeah. One last thing on just to strengthen or back, uh, back up what you're saying there. We've known this for decades. And even in what is back in uh, almost 20 years ago in 2004, time magazine on their cover. I mean, for it to get to time magazine, it's, it, you know, it had wow. to go through a lot of uh, layers and it was the cover story. It was called the secret killer. The surprising link between inflammation and heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's, and other diseases. And it's the inflammation which starts with the insulin resistance. So you were right all along, Doc. Well, it wasn't me. There were some smarter people than me, but um, <laughs> thank you. And i tell you what, I'm going to ask uh, Heather. Heather, are you going to the event or not? I believe I am. Yes. <laughs> I put you on the spot. We're right on the cusp. We are. Uh, in terms of, uh, we've had a huge impact uh, in terms of folks saying, yeah, I'm very interested. I'd like to come on, come on down. It started with uh, myself and Jeannie and uh, it's growing into something where we're having to get a bigger boat. And that's exciting because most people... <laughs> Most people think this is just a conference where you go and you sit for two days and you hear the kind of stuff that we talk about on the channel. And yes, you can do that, but that's not really what the big thing is about. You know, Daniel and I were talking this past Saturday on the show today, and he was bringing up a really good point. He said, he said, doc, you know, I've seen, I've seen it once. I've seen it twice. I've seen it two or three times. You're not really telling folks what this is so daniel you want to go ahead and share some of that well what i you know the the meat and potatoes so to speak <laughs> of the uh of the event isn't just like what you said even though they're going to get um tons of valuable information uh and so forth um as well as a free copy of your book and mine 
uh, and other things, uh, but it's the testing that's going on. You're going to be delivering some amazing testing. Uh, first of all, the first day as you uh, uh, promote there is the CIMT, the carotid intima media thickness test, which I, I, don't, I still don't think people understand how, the value of it. They don't. There, there was a study that was over 10 years of over 13,000 people and they found that the predictability statistic of predicting heart attacks and strokes was 98.6%. Now that statistic, 98.6, is unheard of in medical screening and testing. And the the added feature that you're going to be doing that that day is that not only are you going to get it analyzed the next day with Dr. Ford and his team, but you're going to eliminate the difficulty that you can have, not everybody has, in getting this test because most docs don't know what it is. And if you get it done somewhere else and you take it to your doc, they're going to go, well, what is this? I don't know what this is. Echolucent plaque, echogenic plaque. I'm sorry, I can't, you know, go back. But anyway, you have to, I mean, the first time I got it, I have to. I had to drive 90 miles to get it. The second time, it was like maybe only 60. So what they do is you call Cardio Risk, which is this wonderful place that offers um, the CIMT, and then they have affiliates all over the country in various big cities and locales and that kind of thing. But you never know exactly how far it's going to be from you. Here you have it right at the uh, conference, you have it done the first day. The next day, you get it analyzed by the the experts at PrevMed, and um, you get your results. In addition to all that, you get the secret sauce. Prior to your arrival, <laughs> prior to your arrival, Doctor Ford's team will email you a requisition form that you print out. You take it to your local lab, with, which is probably within a mile or two or three. You get a blood draw and you get all of, and then prior to your arrival, the team gets it. They analyze it and they're ready for to see you when you get there, whether it's the first day or the second day. I don't know how you have that lined up, Doc, but you, I don't you either. Get over, you get to go over all of your blood labs, the important ones. And again, this is the secret sauce out of chapter 22 that's in the book of the top most important blood labs that you need to check that your doctor usually doesn't. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, a friend of mine sent me his labs and I was telling him how about make sure you get the GGT and they had ALT and ASP and ALT and, you know, those liver enzymes, but the most important one is GGT gamma glutamyl transferase because that is, as we've covered before, the number one, it's, the life insurance actuaries want to know who whose uh, application do they reject? And they need to reject the ones that have high elevated GGT, gamma glutamyl transferase, because that has all-cause mortality written all over it. And these life insurance actuaries, they don't care about medical science. They're just crunching numbers. It's just business to them. They got to know who to reject and who to accept. And GGT is the number one all-cause mortality predictor. Total cholesterol, LDL, they don't even make it onto their <laughs> um, all-cause mortality predictor lists. They don't, they don't even make it on the list. It's GGT. So that's another example. So I pointed that out to him. I said, look, and my brother just went through the same thing. He was with the VA. I said, look, you got to go in, show him page such and such in Daniel Trevor's book. Say, this is my brother. And he found this out. This is what the life insurance companies use. But anyway, look, why doctors don't know that is just amazing. And you're going to get all of those analyzed by doc, doc, Dr. Ford and his experts. So have either of you heard of the term a pop-up restaurant? Sure. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is. It's a pop-up clinic. You get all your labs, you get your CIMT, and those are not, not easy to do. So anyhow, why don't we move on? And we talked about the book. Anything else you want to say about the book before we get into the, the labs, chapter 18? Uh, um, no, I think we could just go ahead. Uh, it's available on Amazon. Or uh, the best way to turn people onto it, if you can... 
forgive me, my use of that, uh, is to send them to www.danieltrevor.com that you see there. That way they can watch my seven-minute video. They can find out what happened to me and learn about the book. They can also see all the endorsements. And that usually is the thing that closes them to, on being interested. And there's also a buy now button. There's a, You can just click the logo that says Amazon. It takes you right to Amazon and you can purchase it. So uh, www.danieltrevor.com. Very good. So <clears throat> why don't we get started? Um, this is the uh, short form uh, content in terms of the science. This is an article about the topic for today. Don't guess tests. And I don't know if you have this in your, is this in your book, Daniel? Oh, sure. I include this, I, you know, because I tell that, that stat that, and I think it's this one that, uh, is this 2019? Oh, this is, yeah, the Hopkins, uh, John Johns Hopkins, right? Yeah. Yeah, by I, saying, I have that in there where I just say, look. Uh, what is it? Seventy-four percent of yeah. doctors don't know how to properly diagnose diabetes, pre-diabetes, let alone know how to treatment. And seventy-four percent—that includes everybody: your cardiologists, internists, primary care physicians. <laughs> they send out these surveys, and they got—they don't do the right. They may all they check is if they check that uh, is fasting glucose and A one C, and that is not enough to know whether you're in trouble or not. That was me. I had, you know, I had normal <laughs> until I did the OGTT with insulin. It was like, what? What was that, Heather? I, that was me as a provider in family practice. I mean, an annual physical, you get your hemoglobin A1C and then the fasting glucose that comes with the CMP or the comprehensive metabolic panel. Yeah. If there's one thing I repeat a lot, Daniel, I'm glad you've got it in the in the book. It's this study, this statistic, Singh and Al from uh, Singh and Associates. That's what et al means. Um, and it's uh, a group at Hopkins looking. It's called a KAP survey. Knowledge, KAP stands for knowledge, attitude and practices. And that's what they were looking at. The um, w one of the biggest questions that comes up is, well, if metabolic disease Prediabetes, diabetes, insulin resistance, if that's the big killer and disabler, why is it so prevalent and why are so many people not aware? Well, these guys did a KAP study. They looked at internists, family practitioners, and cardiologists because cardiologists play such a primary care role in terms of their role with prevention. Unfortunately, even though there is a, uh, a specialty called prevention, I trained on it in Hopkins or at Hopkins, but, uh, there are very, very few people in actually in prevention. The majority of people that uh, go into it actually end up in a public health environment. So there's even fewer that actually go out and practice it. So out of a... Um, a graduating class of 300 to 1,000. Guess how many uh, end up uh, graduating class of med school of 300 to 1,000. Guess how many actually end up going, getting preventive medicine training? Probably less how percent. No, no, no. Uh, less than one. One out of that three to 300 to 1,000. It's just, there's just you know not. What make, you know what makes that even more startling? The Hippocratic Oath that all doctors take. Hippocrates said, the father of, of course, the one who wrote the Hippocratic Oath, he said, and I'm quoting, I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. That's what makes it even more startling, right? That's the first rule. I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. <laughs> but he left out the most important part. Okay. Uh, Heather, Daniel, either, either one of you have a guess on what that might be? But it doesn't get paid. <laughs> I was going to say that, but I didn't know. Thought, <laughs> insurance wow, doesn't, yeah. insurance yeah. doesn't cover that. I'm so telling that's... you, you know, I have this study in the book where um, I base it on, uh, I come up with this. Some are believing in this whole concept of a cured patient is a lost customer. And Goldman Sachs, hmm. and I read about that, I think it's in chapter yeah. seven, 
Goldman Sachs, the one of their analysts, that. one of their analysts did a survey or, or a white paper, research paper, advising all their pharma companies and biotech companies that look, you know, cures may be good for society, but it's not good for the bottom for line. Business. And the example they gave was like Harvoni, which was I forget the name of the uh, the 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 big pharma company, but it cured C, it had a ninety percent ninety six percent cure rate of hepatitis C. And the first year out, it was like $12 billion blockbuster. Within a couple of few years, it was down to 75%. And it kept going down from there. So it's like, oh, my God. Anyway. It's certainly a labor of love. Yeah. Well, that's good. I'm glad that we have people like you that are devoted to this because, you know, it helps people avoid disease and it could save their life. So, uh, Heather, you want to talk about um, insulin survey? Yeah, I can read this slide. Um, so the oral glucose tolerance test, or as we refer to it, the OGTT with the insulin survey. Um, if I could get only one test, this would be it. Uh, you, you may know insulin resistance as prediabetes. Less than 5% with prediabetes are even aware that they have it. And so we recommended... Uh, it, along with the OGTT. Uh, so the OGTT is um, with the insulin response, expect to be, you know, at the lab for a couple of hours. Uh, the biggest thing is we want to make sure that you're getting a fasting glucose as well as a fasting insulin. Then you're going to drink that 75 gram of straight glucose, which is kind of like a, a soda. Um, and then, uh, then an hour after you drink that, the, the lab needs to measure your glucose and your insulin response. And then two hours after you, after the drink. Um, so those are the biggest things, uh, that you want to make sure that you're keeping up with that time because the labs get busy and, you know, you want to make sure that, um, you're setting like a timer on your watch or your phone and to find something to do while you're at the lab. We don't want you up walking around because that can skew the results of the test. So bring a good book or an iPad, download some shows and just kind of, you know, commit to just sitting and waiting uh, for each of those blood draws. But that will give us the best um, picture of if you have, you know, insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes over a fasting blood sugar or a hemoglobin A1C. So Heather, you mentioned, you said two, well, what are the two most common problems? One of them is that the lab tech doesn't get the insulin survey or they Correct. draw the insulin all at one time. And that doesn't do us any good. We need an insulin with each of the blood sugar draws. But the other, uh, other of the two most common problems is some, somebody gets bored, they get up and walk around between tests. Now, what happens? Why does that skew the test? Because the muscles that you're using to walk around is taking the glucose out of the bloodstream into the muscle. So it's going to look like your numbers are great when they weren't. weren't. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, Daniel, when you saw this, uh, this, um, slide on uh, this image on the, on the slide on the deck, uh, you you gave a big reaction. What what was that all about? And well, you know, I I write this in the book about how as you age, insulin resistance goes up, but I never saw it on a chart. And I could have used this in my book. <laughs> this chart. Yeah, that's right. You wanted it in the book. You're you're you're, you're focused on the book right now, and you didn't have that. Well, you know, it's but you just, did read the book, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, what's his name's book? <laughs> oh, Kraft. Yeah, Joseph Kraft. Yes, he's. Uh, He's the father of it all. He's the one that discovered that if you have, I forget the exact quote, but if you have heart disease, you are, you have type two diabetic, yeah, diabetic or pre-diabetic yeah. at, at yeah. least, and you're undiagnosed. And, and, and yes. that's because you, of the you have it, you just weren't diagnosed. And I think exactly. he's right. And he discovered that right. because he had done thousands of autopsies and discovered that the root cause of atherosclerosis is this whole thing of prediabetes and the, the, the decimation of the glycocalyx, which is the protective lining on the uh, endothelium, the lining of the arteries, which prevents the small, dense LDL from getting in there to build up plaque. And, well, you know how all that goes. We've covered that in other, 
other things, but it's so important. This insulin is just amazing. I give an example, a couple of them in the book with regard to movies. I say, uh, you remember uh, there's a section in chapter two called, I call it the longevity club. And I say, do you remember the movie fight club starring Brad Pitt? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. The first rule. I, have, of fight I don't club think is I've ever seen the whole book, but I've seen so many or a movie, but I've seen so many references to it. Well, when he's in, you know, down in the fight club, which is usually in, in, in some basement someplace, the first rule of fight club is you do not talk about fight club. The second rule of fight club is you do not talk about fight club. So then I say, imagine we have a longevity club. If so, the first rule of the longevity club would be pay attention to your insulin. Second mm. rule of longevity club, pay attention to your insulin. So, yeah. um, you know, I give that one. Uh, it, it's just that so important because that is where the, uh, that's where all the inflammation, the spark of the inflammation starts. And the inflammation, of course, as you know, as we stated before, that they even made it under the cover of Time magazine 19, 20 years ago, um, is the silent killers, heart disease, cancers, um, Alzheimer's and other diseases start with internal inflammation. When you started to say that is where the I thought you were getting ready to quote the Willie Sutton rule. Oh, <laughs> where's the That's money? Where, Willie Sutton oh, was the uh, bank robber that got caught. Why do you rob him, banks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where the money is. <laughs> exactly. And insulin, it's, it, it, the analogy here is insulin is where the inflammation is. And uh, we, we're bringing on a channel manager to help us with some of our stuff, like uh, getting us geared back up with microphones and cameras again. And so he's starting to understand this stuff. And he has been focused recently on uh, why is it, you know, what's this link between insulin and inflammation? You see that when you look at rapamycin, for example. Mm. Um, <clears throat> rapamycin is a way of, of trying to uh, stimulate or decrease cardiovascular inflammation without having to do fasting or caloric restriction or intermittent fasting or prolonged fasting. Because at the end of the day, uh, it's uh, insulin very much linked to inflammation. One of the key things to, to think about and remember that, that may help you connect the dots is IGF. Mm. Insulin like growth factor. It is, Maybe it's not the, the twin brother of insulin, but it's clearly a first degree relative. Very, very similar like things. That's why it's called insulin-like growth factor. And insulin itself is a growth factor as well. So and growth Gary, is, what's that? I was gonna say, even Gary Taubes points out the fact that the IGF can be basically uh, a precancerous, pre condition. In other words, right. if you have high elevated blood glucose, that's potentially a precancerous uh, condition. So cancer is growth gone wild and uh, major focus with uh, insulin like growth factor. And again, if, if you don't think that insulin is a growth factor in and of itself, what, what do you think it is? So again, we're starting to get to the core of metabolic disease. Uh, let me go to the next slide, unless either one of you has something else you want to cover on that. Well, I had one other um, movie analogy, if you wouldn't mind. I mean, I, people seem to like hearing those, but uh, having at the end of chapter seven, there's a section called The Matrix Has You. And unless you've been living in a cage since 1999, you know that the movie The Matrix, right? And with... Um, Neo, played by the actor Keanu Reeves, mm -hmm. he's asleep at his desk. Words appear on his computer. Wake up, Neo. The Matrix has you. So if you're eating the SAD, the standard American diet, big food has you. And your taste buds. Mm -hmm. And your appetite. And your dopamine, which is the neuro-signaling messenger that uh, your brain emits to create feelings of pleasure and uh, reward. And if it owns this, if big food owns that part of you, it owns all of you <laughs> and you are big foods battery. You remember the movie where everybody's yeah. 
your body becomes the battery for the matrix. And, um, you know, at some point, what was his name? Morpheus. Oh, yeah. He's the captain Morpheus. of the Nebuchadnezzar, Morpheus and the crew. Mm -hmm. And he says uh, something like, I'm trying to free your mind, Neo, but I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. Then I write, lowering your insulin is the door. You must walk mm -hmm. through it to achieve the health, wellness, slimness, energy, and longevity that you want. And the final thing of that section is, are you ready for Neo's long black coat, dark glasses, and machine guns? You'll get plenty of ammo and a few rocket launchers in the upcoming chapters, enabling you to blow that door down. That's how important insulin is. We got to get it low. You know, anyway, get um, that last showbiz thing in there. <laughs> well, I tell you, though, I, th I think that's great. It does help people to start uh, drawing the analogies, you know, from movie world or wherever to the messages we're trying to make here. One of the things that we continue to struggle with is how to make this understandable. Uh, Scotty uh, LP is saying there's a video here, inflammation and heart disease. Not all bad, but I'd love to hear your comments on it. So I'll, I'll put that in terms of uh, a recap on this slide. At the end of the day, uh, over 90% of heart attacks uh, are caused by cardiovascular inflammation not just build up of stable plaque. It's plaque that's been inflamed through a process called inflammation. As uh, uh, David has mentioned, and as we've, we've mentioned multiple times, the vast majority of that comes from insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is the classic metabolic disease. Well, how does it work? What causes it? As our body ages, we our insulin receptors just get to where they don't respond as well. So it takes more insulin to keep our blood sugar at a low, safe level. So uh, then what happens? Well, you, you start off being unable to burn carbs. The body's reaction raises the insulin. And what people don't understand is insulin has another function. It makes sense when you think think about it, but most people are not aware of it. Insulin wants you to get that blood sugar low. So one of the things it does is it, it decreases our ability to burn fat. Now you put those two together. It started as an inability to burn carbs. Now it's resulting in an inability to burn both carbs and fat, our two major fuel sources. You mentioned Gary Taubes earlier. Uh, Gary Taubes made the quote multiple times, and it's hard for people to wrap their heads around it. It's sort of like the uh, uh, Neo and, and this stuff about the mind warp that goes through that movie. He said, <laughs> people think we get fat when we get middle-aged because we're eating more. That's not what's going on. We're getting fat because, I mean, we're eating more because we're getting fat. And we're getting fat in reality because we cannot burn our energy sources. That's what's going on. So after going through all that, what's the practical implication? You stop stimulating that insulin and uh, changing your body uh, composition, uh, lower your body fat, increase your muscle, and decrease glycemic carbs, carbs that lay, raise your blood sugar. Those are the two things that will decrease your insulin and start getting you out of that uh, fight club and into the longevity club that you're talking about. <laughs> now, the, the big impact of this slide is, makes the issue about age. Uh, if we, we say it a lot. The big three things that drive insulin resistance are, as we talked about, um, uh, too much body fat. But we used to think body fat was an inert energy storage tissue. It's not. It drives insulin resistance. A lot of people think the obesity ed epidemic that's going on is driving the diabetes epidemic. It's helping, but it's not the number one driver. Uh, people say, well, my, my family has diabetes. It's riddled with diabetes, so it's genetic. Yeah, genetic's important as well. 
But the bottom line is when you do, there's ways of looking at this through things called multiple regression and whole bunch of ways of looking at those three. Bottom line, the biggest driver of insulin resistance is age. There are plenty of people that are young and obese that don't have in, much insulin resistance at all. There are people with genetic, uh, genetically driven problems here. Again, uh, those are not nearly as big as just getting old. And that's what you see in this slide. Basically, every decade of life, you are more and more likely to have a problem. Now, if you think that this slide is overdone, go back and look at more recent information from uh, UCLA Public Health or even JAMA Network. Those studies are showing that insulin resistance starts to happen by age 30 or before age 30. And by the time you're age 30, you and your peers that are 30 years old, over half of you have this problem. So this is not just an issue of old people. As you mentioned, Dave, we start to see our problems. It takes a while for our body to just give in and start having things like heart attacks. It continues to fight the good fight sometimes for decades. But if we start to get earlier and earlier in this process, we can keep people well longer and longer. Mm -hmm. And this thing that uh, David Sinclair says about living to 120, I think it's a possibility. So I've gone on another rant. Let me, let me be quiet and let's uh, move on here to the next slide. Plaque evaluation. I should probably take this one. Uh, if you go back to folks like Tim Russert, he was the classic for saying, hey, doc, I'm having some problems. My blood pressure is going up. I'm gaining some weight. Could we just get a stress test and make sure I'm going to not have a heart attack? And his doc said, okay, he did the stress test. Russert passed it with flying colors because he was a runner. You know, I've gotten people come back to me and say, look, I was, I knew Tim Russert. He wasn't that much of a runner. I, I, okay. Bottom line was he passed the stress test. A, a couple of months later, he was recording for his show. And I can't, I always have this mental block, whether it's meet the press or, Meet the press. Yeah, meet, meet the press. Yeah. And he, uh, his producer walked in. It was a Saturday. He was doing some pre recorded uh, sections of it. He looked up to the producer, said, What's happening? Which was what you used to say back then. Um, a formed a clot in his coronary arteries. The clot killed him and he died immediately. Just like Daniel said, over half of us do when that's our first symptom of having a heart attack. Now, the uh, pathologist went in and looked, and they said, well, his arteries looked like the arteries on the left with some other components, looked like they had acne. If you look at this yellow stuff, it's like pus that you see in a whitehead on acne. And there were whiteheads all up and down the arteries of his, um, of his, car his heart. Uh, so they were spewing out this white, st this yellow, greenish stuff on a regular basis. And when that happens, you're at risk for forming a clot. That's exactly what Daniel, I mean, what, um, well, that's what Daniel had. And that's what, uh, uh, what Tim Russert had. This, this image brings up a whole different section or a different topic. And it has to do with calcification. Uh, if you look at the pink one on the pink section on the right versus the pink section on the left, you see that that is the pink section is much bigger on the right. This is what's this is their what they're using to represent stable plaque, and that's the issue. If you start, uh, you decrease your body fat, increase your muscle mass, improve your sleep, decrease your insulin then your body starts losing this uh, yellowish, greenish stuff and replacing it with the stable plaque, which is not going to form a pimple, which is not going to spew inflammation into the artery. So a stress test a good test? No, it's not. Is calcium score? Calcium score is better. CT angiogram may have a, it's got a lot of, uh, a lot of promise for the future, 
but the simplest, easiest, and, and clearest at this point is, is CIMT. There are some forms of CT angiogram that are about to catch up. And as Daniel mentioned, the CIMT is what we're going to be having at the event in St. Pete in Florida, December 1st, 2nd, 3rd. Yes, and I also should say that the CIMT, there's no disrobing, it's non-invasive, it's just a, a sonographer who is a person that does ultrasound, uh, checks it through your neck, because if you have it in the carotid arteries, you've got it in a lot of other places on your body. So that's where it's e most easily accessed and measured, and that's what you can expect when you show up there. So, so what happens ten, is ten the minutes, ultrasound... 15 minutes? Yeah, it takes less than 15 minutes. There's no radiation... Again, it's part of, um, of the evaluation when you come down to the event. So we're looking for just what portion of, A, do you have plaque at all? And because if you do, then your body's been going, stepping into that inflammation area. And B, if you do have plaque, how calcified is it? How stable is it? That's what we want to know. So... Uh, Heather, if you will take us, uh, walk us through the cardiovascular inflammation panel and talk about some lipids for a second, and we'd appreciate it. So when we order, uh, you know, labs for patients, we obviously are going to first thing do the oral glucose tolerance test with the insulin response, but then we also do um, mm -hmm. cardiovascular inflammation, uh, indicators, which is your MPO, the myeloperoxidase, um, the LP PLA2, which is the phospho, uh, lipase A2 associated lipoprotein, the high sensitivity CRP, which is their C-reactive mm -hmm. protein, and then the microalbumin creatinine ratio, which is a urine test, which is the MACR. So those are your inflammatory markers that we look at. Um, and instead of doing a traditional lipid panel, which is what most family practitioners and internists will do with your annual physical, we like to look at um, the APOB, the APOA1, the LDL, LP little a, total cholesterol, HDL, and we fraction, and also a lipid fractionation where it really kind of dives down into um, the LDL particles, uh, you know, looking at the sizes of the LDL, the size of the HDL, we want them big and fluffy. Um, so that's where the fractionation can really kind of help us identify areas, um, you know, of poor carbohydrate metabolism. So Daniel, any comments? Well, I just, uh, maybe you can, for the audience, I mean, we know what the word fraction means, you know, it's a 10th of something or it's a half mm -hmm. of something, or it's a quarter of something, but when we use fractionation of a lipid, can you elaborate on what that means so that the, um, well, we're going to go there in just a second. Oh, okay. As you see, All right. We've got APOB there. That's the thing that I started one of my rants on already about APOB okay. being, LDL and lipidologists clothing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, APOB, APOA1, LDL, LP little i, total cholesterol, HDL. So we get actual um, bell curves. These are the two bell curves on HDL in the lower part because it's, you got density here. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see if I can move that. In the next slide, we're going to talk about the actual bell curves. So HDL is found in a distribution. LDL is found in a distribution. And I know, uh, Daniel, I, I know Heather does this because she does this all day, every day. But I, I know that you know this as well. People talk about it's the large, fluffy HDL that's really important, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And they yeah. also talk about large fluffy LDL is really healthy for you. And it's the small dense LDL. That's a problem, right? Well, you know, Remember they call that? pattern A and pattern B, right? Yep. And they also call it pattern A and pattern B. Pattern mm -hmm. A is the pattern where you haven't lost that large fluffy LDL. Mm -hmm. Pattern B is the pattern, the LDL pattern where you have lost your large fluffy LDL. And here's why this all goes right back to 
metabolic disease. So if somebody can't metabolize their carbs, here's what's happening. Uh, the, they're starting to, we talked about metabolic disease earlier. We didn't get too deep in terms of where it goes. So if you're starting to store, if, if, if you can't burn your carbs, as we said, your body reacts, it starts to increase the insulin level, and that increased insulin makes it harder to burn fats. So you're hungry. You can't burn either carbs or fats so well. You get hungry, you eat more, and you eat more, so you start getting fat. So where do you store that fat? Several places. Go ahead and, and give us a couple. Heather? The belly Daniel? is the first place. <laughs> yeah. Belly? Belly. And then you have the visceral fat, which is in the organs or the muscles. Okay. So in reality, there's two places in the belly. Everybody th talks about belly first, but there's the visceral in the belly, and then there's some what we call sub-Q. What does that mean? Just right under the skin. Yeah, cutaneous. Q stands for cutaneous, and cutaneous means skin, and sub means under. So uh, fat under the uh, skin, which it's happens at the jiggles. belly. And, go ahead. <laughs> it's what jiggles in the mirror. <laughs> it's what jiggles. It's love handles. Yeah. It, uh, you get it on the hips. You know, that's, you, you can't burn your carbs, so you can't, you end up not, so your insulin goes up and then you can't burn your fats and you're feeling hungry. So, because you're not burning either one. So you eat more, the more you eat, the more you start storing it. Well, guess what? One of the places you store it is LDL. Now that's a whole, uh, that's a whole bunny hole that I just don't think we have time to go down today, but, um, one thing that happens is you start, start storing these fats, these fatty acids in the larger, fluffier HDL particles and the larger, fluffier LDL particles. And this is, you know, I mentioned earlier, there was some, I'm a big Dayspring fan, and this is one of the things I learned from watching uh, Dayspring and Atia and looked it up and I uh, got some good confirmation. Those large, fluffy HDL and LDL are no longer carrying cholesterol anymore. When they pass through the liver, the liver burns them as, as fuel. So you start losing your large, fluffy HDL and your large, fluffy LDL. In the past, Quest used to give us these actual bell curves so I could actually show patients what was going on. Talk about the world being complicated. You would think... If it's the same mechanism for HDL and LDL, it would do the same thing to the two bell curves, but it doesn't. HDL bell curve, you get this big shark bite out of the larger part. On the LDL bell curve, it skews. Um, you start to, you know, the, the long tail of the skew starts going up because you're losing the larger uh, LDL particles. So <clears throat> what happens with, uh, with both of these? You lose your large HDL, you lose your large uh, LDL. People think it's H large HDL saving you. I would say it's the absence of large HDL that's a biomarker for metabolic disease. Mm -hmm. um, type uh, A pattern on LDL is... It's a pattern where you've retained those large fluffy LDLs and they say that's healthy. And sure enough, you do the, the epidemiology on it and it's clearly type A, in other words, a, a, a standardized looking balanced LDL curve is healthy. But when you start losing those large LDL cur uh, particles, it goes where we call it, the average... Um, Size decreases, you get what we show, are showing here on the screen, um, a decreased peak size, and that's been shown multiple times that's associated. You're going to have a heart attack or a stroke. So <clears throat> when you get deeper into our secret sauce, to go back to the title of the show, this is what we do with patients. Uh, Heather, any yeah. other comments, any things I didn't cover on this? Well, you know, I'd, I wouldn't, if you don't mind, I'd like to give an analogy that I give in the book to make it uh, easier for the reader. I say, look, just think of um, 
Well, there's the two, like you're talking about the large fluffy HDL uh, or LDL rather. <clears throat> and that doesn't do damage. And it's the small dense LDL that does the damage. And if they just think of, just think of the uh, arteries as lined with cobblestone, like a cobblestone street, you know, with cracks and crevices, that kind of thing. If you throw out a bunch of beach balls, they're just going to bounce around freely and not do any damage and just kind of be on their way. Just like if you threw out some basketballs, it's, it's going to bounce around. Whereas if you throw out some marbles, they're going to get stuck in the cracks and the crevices and eventually make their way subendothelial, in other words, beneath the artery walls, especially after the glycocalyx is destroyed by all the sugar and carbs. And then they're going to attach the proteoglycans and get stuck there like Velcro and accumulate over time. And that's where your plaque buildup eventually happens. So you want to turn those small, dense LDL particles into the large, fluffy beach balls. Mm. And you can do that with a low carb diet exercise. You know, you got to do the whole routine in order to turn them. But the lucky thing is you can turn them small, uh, dense LDL into the large fluffy ones that don't do any damage. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Maybe that might be a little help to some people. That helps. And again, it's when I start spewing stuff about, uh, uh, bell curves, I think that sort of loses people. So thank you for <laughs> reinterpreting that. Hey, yeah. Susan, I have this running joke back and forth. Is I uh, he'll say it for me, and I'll say it for him. It's it, do, have you seen any of the skits where the comedian uh, Obama is sitting down making some sort of statement, and the comedian is next to him saying what he means is, and it <laughs> gets very emotional. <laughs> so that's what we do for each other, and thank you for doing that for me. Anything else on this before we move on? Other than oh. we have many patients who they make those lifestyle changes and they can go from a B to an A. And it's so great to see yeah. that their yes. hard work pays off. It, it, there's, there's no question that that's what's going on. These guys are doing the hard work. You know, it's funny. Uh, we're Because of um, some things that happened a few months ago, we started getting a big increase in patients. And, it was what two thirds of them would come in and say, yep, I've lost like 30 pounds. We'd say, congratulations. Um, you've already saved maybe a decade or two of life. And, and they would say, thank you. It's good to hear that from people that do what you do, but they'd also say, look, um, not all of them, but the majority of them said, look, I did that from watching your videos. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was nice and exciting to hear. But at the end of the day, our videos did not, help them push away from the table and get out and start running. They did the hard work, hard work. You know, they're, uh, they're Luke Skywalker and we're just Yoda. That's right. <laughs> That's Yoda a great was hard to, Yoda was hard to understand too. So, um, <laughs> Heather, you want to talk about, um, our other markers? So we will check, you know, <laughs> vitamin B12, uh, your vitamin D. We'll do a complete thyroid panel because we want to make sure, again, metabolic processes. Uh, thyroid is very much um, included, inclusive in that. Um, your CMP, which is a uh, complete metabolic panel that looks at, you know, your kidney function, liver, some of your electrolyte levels, and that fasting glucose is there as well. Your CBC complete blood count just to identify if there's any kind of anemias or uh, abnormalities going on with uh, white blood cells or any of your particular white blood cells. Magnesium, uric acid, uh, you know, because elevated levels of uric acid can be contributing to inflammation. So those that have gout. Um, homocysteine, uh, you know, which ties back to the vitamin B12, the methylmalonic acid. In the FT uh, isoprostatine creatinine ratio. Daniel, any comments? No, that looks like a good uh, a good lineup there. Just to make sure that with your CMP and CBC, your doctor gets well. You're going to get it when, if you come to the uh, event, of course. Make sure that they include GGT because I see so often that doctors exclude 
GGT, which is a very, very, it's the most important um, liver to know, to find out if you've got any kind of fatty liver disease, because it's, what is it, two or three billion people on the planet? It's the largest liver disease on the planet. And you got to know if you have that. And um, because it's, it's so connected to all cause mortality, like I said, it's what life insurance companies use to know who to reject on their application. If you got elevated GGT, that just screams mortality risk. So, so make sure that they don't exclude GGT, gamma glutamyl transferase. Uh, Daniel, as you know, you're a big fan of GGT. And as I said, we looked at it a lot in the past. We dropped it. We haven't been doing it in a long time. We're looking at going ahead and restating it just to, just to satisfy you. <laughs> hey, don't do it to me. Listen, like I said, it's not like these actuaries, the insurance companies are really interested in medical science. It's just business to them. They want to know right. who they're going to lose a ton of money off of very soon if they have elevated GGT or they're just going to reject the application. I mean, that's why even online you can go on and, and search for tips and tricks of how to get approved if you've got elevated ggt i mean it's it's becoming a known thing and the fact that doctors don't most doctors don't know that it's just why don't they know what the life insurance companies know they're protecting their own bottom line so let's protect our health there's uh only so much you can do but uh for for example i've had to drop things like 9p21 4Q25, all of the genetics associated with cardiac disease, coronary disease. And it's because, you know, you got to you gotta say when somewhere. Uh, Heather, do you mind checking in with the group uh, when, uh, when you get a chance to find out what the status is on getting GGT? Sure. Uh, the, the Daniel Trevor test. <laughs> yes. yes. And the other test that, you know, I, I know I've seen some of the comments. We do look at triglycerides, HDL, and calculate that ratio as well. So I did want to mention that. Oh, thanks. I hadn't noticed that. I'm trying to juggle too many things here. No, so, uh, <clears throat> and we'll get, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get to the transition a little bit later. Um, and speaking of which, I noticed we didn't have the water ball. The water ball is one of my favorite parts of the show. And I don't know why we didn't have that today. Do you, Heather? I'm not That's sure. That's a classic, the water ball. <laughs> so uh, before we, speaking of transition, anything else uh, before we uh, transition over? Daniel, any last tag on your book? Well, listen, like I said, the easiest way, if you have a friend or family member or yourself, if you're just watching for the first time to get introduced to it is go to DanielTrevor.com, Watch my seven minute video. Just below it are all the endorsements from these amazing world class people that I'm just I'm still blown away that I was able to get them, um, you know, raving about the book and, and, and the work and so forth. And then, you know, there's also a button there that you can buy now if you want. And you just click the Amazon logo and it takes you right to Amazon and you can uh, purchase it there. So that's all, you know, if, if you're interested or you want to relay the uh, this information to the uh, your friends and family, DanielTrevor.com. My book has all that we've covered so far in today's and uh, today's Plus a show. whole lot more. Yeah. We and had the, written, we had the main cuts in terms of labs. You didn't. It's you, you, all it took was another chapter. You could just Say add again. and add. I said, you know, when we're trying to skinny this down to make it something that's the most effective and efficient for a patient in terms of costs and time and focus, we had to make some cuts. All you had to do was add another chapter. Yeah. Hey, listen, I wanted to get the expert in there because as you can see, it says uh, with internationally acclaimed preventive medicine expert, Dr. Ford Brewer, who applies the Hippocratic Oath of prevention is preferable to cure. <laughs> Not the Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> so again, look forward. I've uh, look forward to seeing how things go with the book, Daniel. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. And uh, as I said, uh, I had three patients last week. I had a couple of patients, uh, uh, 
uh, grind on you a little bit and complain, but I had three patients say, I tell you what, I appreciate you having Daniel on the show. He is a major, he's a, I think he's a metabolic doppelganger for me. And it, to see him accomplish what he has accomplished is helping me prevent that heart attack that got him started. So Daniel, I think you're accomplishing what you set out to accomplish. Wow. That's great. That's uh, wonderful to hear. That's Look, you don't get rich writing books, but you uh, at least if you can help others to avoid what you yourself went through um, and live a longer and healthy life and see your kids go down the wedding aisle and the grandkids and all that and add some more decades to your life. Um, that's what it's all about. That's what it's about. So <clears throat> speaking of grinding on and on, speaking of me whining and complaining about, uh, about lack of focus and wrong priorities, speaking of APOB and, and being an uh, LDL in uh, lipidologist's clothing, and speaking of what you brought up before, it's like it's, it's metabolic disease killing us, not LDL. So this came out of the Global Risk Consortium, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, October of this year, new evidence on metabolic disease, metabolic health and LDL. And let me just remind you, you hear the term metabolic disease, metabolic disease, metabolic health. They're talking almost completely about prediabetes, diabetes, insulin resistance, the stuff we've been talking about this whole show. If you just joined and you missed all of that. So which is the bigger issue? A uh, big uh, global risk consortium uh, hammered this out. Here's where they finally ended up. It was a review of cohort studies involving 1,500 uh, 1, million participants all over the world. Metabolic health was a more important factor than LDL. And you got to remember what that says. That sounds like those two are actually competing. When you go back and you remember the slide that we covered here, you begin to realize that LDL is really more of a marker of metabolic disease. It's mm. probably not the initial actor. So anyhow, even looking at those two, insulin resistance and diabetes were associated with cardiovascular death more so than lipids. So there we're going to be go. going a little bit deeper into this discussion, this um, Global Risk Consortium uh, next week. So if you'll give us the transition, uh, you can maybe you can give us the water ball and the transition, and we'll go into Q&A. Because I missed that one. There you go. We got that water ball in after all. Uh, so whoever created that is great. I love that water ball. It's a wonderful, it's very aesthetic. Yeah. I got that on Upwork. What? 35 bucks. It's amazing. <laughs> so, I love Upwork. Uh, Heather, you're going to be the answer, uh, answer queen today or you, I tell you what, let's both look at it. Both pull things down. Um, D. Dutton is asking about met metallic met uh, matrix metalloproteinases. Daniel, here comes the matrix yet again. <laughs> Can MMPs contributing to vulnerability of atherosclerotic plaques by degrading the components of the fibrous cup, collagens, elastins, fibronectin, and proteoglycans? Uh, yep, I don't see a question there. Binding capacity of lipophilic and hydrophilic, hydrophil, uh, hydrophilic statins on ECs may explain why the lipophilic reduce MMPs and ruptures. Can lipophilic patavastatin be especially helpful in the first year of treatment? I, the, I don't think any of us know. So the question is, are the lipophilics better? And I know there's a debate out there about that. Um, as you can see, uh, that's not quite the debate that 
I've gotten embroiled in lipophilic versus hydrophilic statins. I'd much rather see people. I'd much rather see people get a little bit more focused and maybe a lot more focused on metabolic disease than they are on LDL and ApoB and all of the other versions of lipids. And I think you I should, what you should add there is the, the fact that I know this for a fact because you tell us that you're more concerned with the inflammation and lowering right. the inflammation than some of these other biomarkers. It's the inflammation that does the damage. And, um, you know, low-dose Crestor does that, Prosuvastatin. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate that. that. I was getting ready to make that comment, but you've already done it. So no <laughs> need. Good morning from Atlanta. Are you aware there's a 30-second commercial at the beginning of your podcast? So we missed the first few seconds of your presentation. I wasn't aware of that. You know, I, because I live on, I've lived on YouTube for a few years now in terms of managing this channel, I bought YouTube premium. So I don't even see the, the commercials. I have to go into incognito mode to start seeing commercials here. And the bottom line is, I don't know how they, they, meaning YouTube, set up, um, uh, commercials in terms of shows. I didn't think they're, su they're supposed to take chunks out of the show. I think that might have just been a unique problem for you today. Rick Foley, well, also, a great point. And so, so those of you who don't know, and it's important because I used to go crazy watching YouTube with all these commercials, and then I found out they have this thing you pay $9.99 a month, and you get no commercials or no ads, none whatsoever, because that's especially good when you're, you know, if you just have some music on, you don't have to listen to commercials between every song or every tune that you're listening to. You get no commercials. It's just nine dollars and ninety nine cents a month. And there you go. Speaking of commercials, that sounds like a commercial for YouTube premium. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. It's so convenient, speaking though. Now, speaking of inflammation, uh, Cindy Levick is asking about inflammation and how to get there. Heather, you want to cover that? Can I reduce uh, HSCRP by weight loss and exercise? A1C 7.6, triglycerides 90, high vitamin D. Yes, as we all talk about lifestyle changes are our main driver here. So certainly weight loss and uh, routine physical activity, looking at HIIT training, your resistance training, and then uh, at least as much as daily aerobic um, activities such as walking, can, those can all be very helpful to reduce that. So I like this one. It's not about the good you do, but the bad you don't do. And as we mentioned before, JMK said Mark Twain should have talked to the lipidologists in the group. <laughs> now, uh, comments. Cree Cree saying uh, he or she eats protein grams per ideal weight daily. What's your thought? Any comments from you two? Well, I, get I just... I, I just uh, advise people to go according to their body weight, um, three to six ounces for per meal. I mean, if you're a large person, you're going to maybe need more, but uh, you're, especially as you get older, you need more protein. Um, and that's really essential to, uh, I cover this in chapter nine, how uh, muscle is, there was a study out just recently and they basically just said, which I basically cover in chapter nine is that muscle is the organ of longevity. Because if you look at some of these older hunter gatherers, no they still got some muscle going on. They still got a six pack, <laughs> they got, you know, because life is a, a struggle and they didn't have pantries or refrigerators. Snacking was never a thing. I think until about 60 years ago, I don't even know. I'm going to have to look up on the online. Like, uh, where, where did snacking start? Where did that? I mean, I grew up and we didn't have snacks. <laughs> it's like, I mean, maybe at night after, you know, you have your, uh, your dinner or something like that. But uh, at breakfast, we had lunch, we had dinner. We didn't, you know, the schools these days, they're giving them snacks and treats and, 
and the the lunches that they're having for these poor kids it's you know lucky charms and count chocula oh my god these are not designed for um you know growing bodies but uh so anyway the the protein uh, you just got to make sure you get it especially as you age because we need that for the muscle yes so think about it logically um carbs are about three calories per gram Muscles about three calories per gram. Fat is about nine. So if you find out that you you can't metabolize carbs very well, and you start um, decreasing those, and you, you your body tends to want to go gram for gram. You know you're not planning to get a significant decrease in what you're eating. So you start replacing three grams of uh, carbs with three grams of fat, you've just greatly increased the, the amount of calories you're bringing on board. So think about that. That's one of the reasons that I recommend when people do decrease their carbs, they replace them mostly with, um, with, pro with protein. Yeah. More of a, yeah, high, no, high that's a good, that's, that's, that's really good advice. I, um, you know, you want to avoid the ultra processed foods, which, by the way, there's a new study that shows that the um, they had a oops, my microphone is attacking me. They had four groups. It was like what was it, meat eaters and um, omnivores, vegans and vegetarians. And the ones who rate the most ultra processed foods were the vegans, <laughs> which I can understand because when I tried to do vegetarian, I wound up eating. I mean, in retrospect, I'm listening to it. I'm, I'm remembering. And also every vegan and vegetarian I've ever known ate tons of bread, pasta, cereal, crackers, biscuits, waffles, pancakes, chips, pretzels, rolls, pizza. I mean, you name it. It was all carb heavy and it's ultra processed. So listen, I have lots of vegans and vegetarians that I love, but just watch, try to eat real food instead of things that are made in a package and has cellophane around it. Absolutely. And, you know, we're sort of from Switzerland. When you when you ask about what diet do we recommend uh, carnivore, do we recommend vegan or do we recommend something in between paleo, low carb, high carb? First of all, we don't recommend any of those. We recommend that you make sure that you know your own health. When you start to recognize a comment that we made before, by the time you're age 30, your probability of not being able to metabolize carbs in a healthy way is 50%. Then you begin to realize, oh, wait a minute, I need to find out if I'm one of those 50%. Once you find out, if you are, you need to slow down on carbs. And at that point, you can slow down on carbs in any of the other diets, ranging from vegan all the way to carnivore. So I'm going to move on. We, we've hammered that diet issue many times over the past couple of months. I would ask, uh, thank you, Harvey. Yes, please go ahead and click like or a thumbs up. Uh, or even better yet, take this uh, video or one of our videos and send it out on another, uh, another uh, social media. When that happens and, and it draws eyeballs back, uh, the, the YouTube algorithm reads that and says, hey, this is important stuff. It's actually even pulling eyeballs. So that's, uh, thank you so much, Harvey. Now, Richard Jaffe has an interesting question. Dr. Brad St Stanfield talks about evidence that even healthy non-metabolic disease gets atherosclerotic plaque increase with increase in higher LDL and cholesterol in the PACE study. Concerns? Number one, I think one, uh, there are two of the major things that you need to remember when you see studies like that, Richard, are number one, what portion of people are labeled as having non no metabolic disease are actually misdiagnosed? About 90% of the people that have metabolic disease are misdiagnosed. So Great point. You, Great point. Great point. Yep. How do you know that those people did not have metabolic disease? The other thing to think about is, okay, LDL went higher 
uh, was that was that really associated with LDL only, just coming out of the blue, or was it being associated with undiagnosed metabolic disease? Anything else on that before we move on? No, that's just a great point. I mean, I think it was the first slide you showed today was uh, covering the Johns Hopkins, where 74% of doctors, cardiologists, primary care, and so forth, they don't know how to properly diagnose metabolic disorder or metabolic syndrome, a.k.a. insulin resistance type 2 diabetes. So there we go. Uh, Richard Militello says, wow, this ApoB is a big deal. Why don't you do a show devoted to it? We are working on that as we speak. We spent about an hour uh, on that with uh, Jesus and, uh, and Nathan just yesterday. Uh, because it's so close, you know, to use uh, biblical uh, Old Testament terms, because it gores so many people's uh, sacred bull, we're going to make sure <laughs> that we that we actually cover it properly, uh, give appropriate people appropriate due. But again, the bottom line is uh, we're seeing major holes in this focus on ApoB. And I've left it alone for months, even years now. But it, the more we work on it, the more we begin to realize that leaving it alone is a disservice. And here's why. People, you know, my brother's an engineer. We have we have people from all walks of life that look at this stuff. We've got engineers, we've got IT people. And these people have a, they have another career. They have other work to do. We have people that are managing families. They don't have time to get into all of this detail. So they just say, you know, give me the information. I had a, I had a fella come on last week that didn't bring one. He brought two of his own doctors with him. Hey, sis. <laughs> Hey, uh, you know, I give, uh, uh, Heather, you know, I give the team the um, time to go ahead and work with the patient to immunize them against problems with OGTT and whatever. And Jesus was working with this group and I wish he had told me. It's like he was vastly outnumbered. I felt like uh, John Wayne coming up on the, the rag, wagon train and he was circled, but he was just plugging right along. Uh, the guy is a... Uh, runs and owns a company that's a household name. Um, <clears throat> and he kept interrupting everything I said. I finally ended up having to say, look, um, you've asked me the same question twice already. You didn't like it, the answer before. I didn't make it that complicated. It's the reality. I'm just reporting the reality. And if you're not interested, you know, so he, then he backed off. He interrupted me yet again to say, I'm sorry, I'm just a busy guy and I've got a lot of stress and I need to make a decision and move on. If you're telling me I need to do this, I need to do this and move on. That's a very important point when we're talking about ApoB. If ApoB is the problem, then yes, we need to focus on it. Because most people that come into the, our world really only take the time for one thing. This may be something that's going to impact their life for decades, but they're all looking for an easy button. I don't think ApoB is. I don't think there is an easy button, but I do think there is a simpler message in its metabolic disease. So yes, we're going to be spending time looking at it. Uh, Bart Robinson, I wish I could afford to be a patient in your practice. I simply can't find a doctor who takes your approach, and it's very frustrating. We're aware, and that's, you know, that's why we're trying to get as much of this information out for free as possible. Rick wants to come to the conference. We'd love to have you, Rick. Well, yeah. Doc, it just isn't this uh, now a time to say you're planning to have them quarterly instead of just a one-off? Now, Daniel, <laughs> let me remind you, when, when and we talked about that this Saturday, right? Did I lose you? Right, right. I'm with you. Okay. What? And I said, Daniel, we don't want people to start thinking, I don't have to go to that one. I'll just go to one of the next one. <laughs> you just blew our marketing thing all to oh. pieces. Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I should know better because I'm a marketer. 
Yeah, you uh, you yeah, keep yeah, saying yeah. you're a marketer. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure that you're demonstrating it very well oh, at all. Sorry, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that next one is going to be way, way in the future. So it's going to be in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> Starving oh, myself my to God. life. Uh, won't checking FPG and A1C on a regular basis be the way to go? I think that was when we were talking about the oral glucose tolerance, yeah. maybe. Yeah, we do. We 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 want to use a thing called. Uh, you want to describe the Freestyle Libre and the uh, Dexcom Seven, Heather? Um. Yeah, we do. We can order. Those are called CGMs or Continuous Glucose Monitoring. Um, and it's a device. You know, the little uh, patch you put on the back of your arm. And basically, we want you to kind of do a food journal and learn what what foods that you eat will where it takes your blood sugar. Um, so that's a, a more of a live, you know, uh, up to date, regular, uh, continuous checking of that blood sugar to see, you know, what it is when you eat, what it is when you're fasting, what it is with exercise and those sorts of things. So I think that that gives you a better idea of what, um, where your blood sugar truly is versus just the fasting blood sugar, which is a one time, you know, picture just an instant picture um and then the a1c is an average over the last three months so anyhow i think the cgms are a better way to look at that and also if they don't want to get a cgm they can always revert to the uh the, the sticks the, the the uh finger sticks the, the finger the sticks mm -hmm. at your local pharmacy you could buy a kit for 20 bucks or something yep. and you get some you do some of that you, you you stick yourself before you eat and then an hour later and you can see hey why is my blood sugar sky high? You have yep. to look back and think, okay, so what sugar or carbohydrate did I eat that make that go up like that? So CGM just makes it so that it's just, it goes right to your phone, your smartphone, and you can see right there, there's no uh, finger sticks. And you wear it for two weeks. So yeah, I mean, if you can't get that, then the old fashioned glucometer and finger sticks on are good too. And starving, uh, you, we, you bring up a whole topic. Uh, bottom line is most docs think that A1C is the way to go. The American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists says it agrees with me that it's not because it's a hemoglobin test. And there's a whole bunch of things that can change this test outside of just looking and getting your uh, resistance to insulin. So we'll talk about that at another time. Um, uh, Heather, if you could, we're, we're getting pushed for time. So if you could start looking through to see uh, people that are A, members most uh, first, and B, if they are, even if they're not a member, if they've got a good question. While you do that, um, David Howard just joined as a member. Thank you so much, David. We appreciate that. If you got any that, uh, that we need to cover? I'm looking here. Well, in the meantime, I'd like to say that the uh, OGTT with insulin, I mean, that's the, the title of chapter seven in my book is says the whole thing. It's called the most important health test you've never had because <laughs> most doctors don't know that all they do is fasting blood glucose and A1C and that's it. And then because they're in, they can be in normal range. But when you do the OGTT with insulin, you find out the reality and the truth of the matter. That's what happened to me. Yeah, I had normal fasting blood glucose and A1C, but I took the A1 the the fasting the OGTT with insulin. Uh, I can't remember it was the first or second hour, but it was over two hundred. So I, that verified that I was already a type two diabetic, and that was all due to the heart healthy whole grains that I was eating. I was totally so, bought into all that. You're yet another diabetic who had a totally normal fasting glucose. Yes. So JMK brings up a really good point about CIMT. He says, make sure that your lab knows what the heck they're doing. The lab that did my CIMT didn't even evaluate for soft plaque, and that's what we're looking for. And sure enough, if you go to x-rays are us or imaging is us and <laughs> on the corner, 
and say you want to see IMT, they'll think, well, that's an ultrasound of the, of the carotid in the neck. And they'll give you an ultrasound of the carotid, which doesn't show soft plaque or hard plaque or anything. It shows flow in the, in the bloodstream. That's unfortunate because uh, as I think it was the guys at Princeton showed, they said three quarters, two thirds of the heart attacks that occur occur in people with less than 50% blockage. And that's all you're going to pick up on one of these flow studies. So that's not what we're looking for. Thank you, JMK. And that's why, Heather, the, stress, that's why the stress tests don't work. Exactly right. Stress tests are only going to pick up something if you've got a 50% uh, decrease in flow. So, Heather, I'm assuming that means a no. Well, I'm trying to figure out how to bring over those comments so we can review them. Um, Rick was asking about preferred ranges for inflammation markers, which that's pretty detailed response. Uh, let's see here. Uh, looking, looking, looking. Someone asked about how effective turmeric in reducing inflammation and is it contraindicated for those of us taking baby aspirin since turmeric is a blood thinner? Uh, I've got plenty of people taking both. Uh, you can say, well, I don't want to take both, but I don't think there's significant evidence that would, that would underline uh, significant danger with that. What was the other part of the question? Um, that was, that was it on that one. Uh, someone was uh, posting about is dairy hyperinsulinemic. And then, uh, D Dutton responded that it has a lot of uh, leucine because calves need it, but it is a yeah. growth and MTOR activator, which is what we don't want. Yeah. Uh, I would get a lot of folks uh, asking about dairy and clearly in some people, uh, dairy can be a real problem. It's not quite so much in others. Um, bottom line is I don't really worry too much personally about dairy. I don't worry about it that much among my patients so much as I worry the, about the other stuff that we've talked about. If, uh, if you need, if psychologically you need to eat some cheese in order to make your food taste well enough to, uh, to help you get to where you need to be metabolically. I'm not as concerned about that as I am, you know, grains and the amount that you're eating. Anything else before we, uh, before we take off? Looks good. Thank you so much for, no, thank uh, you very much, doc. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you, um, uh, you know, bringing all this to the public because this this information is not covered anywhere. I, I don't see any other shows that are covering this kind of information, and uh, it's so valuable because it's such it it's at the forefront of the latest and greatest science, modern science that 21st century has to offer for your health and longevity. And um, you know, and I used all this to fix myself, and. People can do the same. And speaking of the uh, people, we get a lot of comments from that. Just from, you know, you don't have to be a patient, just watching the videos and doing the work. We got a, a, a hundred people on from one, uh, just one uh, area right now, one platform. We appreciate you guys joining us today. We appreciate your interest. And thanks to you too, as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Heather.